All right. So our first session this morning is going to be with me, with Rungshin, and with Carter. And the goal is to talk really about all things technological, to give you a sense of what we, CS50, provide in the way of uh, technology, um, but also to give you a sense of how you can use or not use our own tools. If you'd like more customization than we ourselves provide, you can actually reinvent some of the wheels we have worked on over time, but use it for your more specific scenario. So we'll focus then on providing first the standard cloud-based programming environments, which I alluded to yesterday when I gave you a history of our non-cloud-based predecessors thereof. Um, so the goals will be for me to first give you an introduction to code spaces specifically, which is the most recent incarnation of this vision of web-based programming environments. Rong Shin will then kindly take over and focus on some of the lower level implementation details. And if you're among those less comfortable teachers, realize that you don't need to do everything we will cover in step two. That's sort of the advanced, more customized version of what's available to you. So if not this year, maybe in the future, maybe never. But we wanted to at least give you a sense of a taste of what you can do without us, per se. Um, Carter will then focus on readying code spaces for your own class, setting up your own classroom, so to speak, so that you can collect your students' uh, work more directly using other tools as well. And then last but not least, certainly nowadays, Rung Shin will focus on all things AI and some of the tools we've alluded to a few times and how Rung Shin and our team this summer have really brought CS50's rubber duck to life. So where do we begin? So Visual Studio Code, aka VS Code, is a very popular, free, open source uh, text editor, so to speak. Um, it's written by Microsoft, but it's sort of taken over a lot of industry in that you can use it not only for Windows environments or Windows programming, but Linux, Mac OS, Android, iOS, um, although less so on the last since Apple has its own thing. But VS Code itself is completely free. It's downloadable on Macs and PCs, but there's still as I mentioned yesterday, these pain points for students and definitely for teachers, if you have to have 10 students, 20 students, 200 students installing Python or something like C or really any programming environment on their own Macs and PCs, we tend to find that it detracts from getting started early in the term. So what we have focused on over the past couple of years is using a web-based version thereof so that we, CS50, can pre-install all of the software, all of the programming language support that you and your students might need. And that is what lives at now cs50.dev, formerly known as code.cs50.io. This is a shorter name, therefore, but it's the exact same web-based environment. It's based on this tool, which is a third-party uh, product from GitHub um, that kindly supports not only our educational use, but yours and other teachers as well. If you're curious to read more about what's going on, you can go to this URL here. But essentially, they are hosting what they call code spaces, but more technically are really just Docker containers. And more on those in just a bit. But you can think of containers as being lightweight virtual machines, sort of the uh, illusion in the cloud of a real physical server, but completely implemented in software. And unlike virtual machines, which might take several seconds, several minutes to start up, containers are, tend to be characterized by being able to start like this, at least once they've been downloaded to the server or to one's own local computer. So many thanks to our friends at GitHub Education in particular. And that last URL I mentioned on the slide is that same group to whom you could apply as a teacher if you want to go beyond the scope of CS50's tools and kind of do things yourself on your own for your class or classes. So here's a screenshot of what the landing page for CS50.dev looks like today, minus some uh, screenshots down here. And just to give you a sense of the range of possibilities, this doesn't technically just support CS50. Um, we've pre-installed not just support for C and Python and SQLite and HTML, JavaScript, and CSS, which we ourselves use in CS50, but other things as well. If you want to teach C++, at least within a command line environment, um, JavaScript via a runtime called Node.js, if you're teaching a Java class, um, Ruby, or a few other environments as well. The only thing to keep in mind, especially if you're teaching other classes for which you might want to use this sa these same tools, is anything that's graphical, like a Java program that might have a GUI using Swing, a library, or other tools, is that just you have to keep in mind you are on the internet or your students are on the internet. So anything that might work very smoothly on a local Mac or PC, maybe a ball bouncing up and forth, back and forth, um, might not work as well over the internet just because of that latency. But there is support, thanks to Rung Shin and team, for graphical things, um, including all of these tools and more. So that just gives you a sense of the lay of the land. This, if you haven't seen it before, is a screenshot of what the experience looks like, at least here in light mode. In general, there's four regions of the screen for students. 
One in black here is just the menu of options. And among the menus, dot, dot, dot is CS50's duck or AI. More on that in a bit. Two is a graphical file explorer that, like a Mac or PC, just shows students graphically what is in their account, files and folders. There's a tabbed code editor, and this is sort of the norm nowadays for writing not just one, but maybe two or more files at a time. And then, per yesterday, a lower level, more powerful terminal window. And that is the textual interface to the underlying code space. Or Docker container, really Linux, the operating system that's running behind the scenes for students and making all of this possible for them. Now, we won't walk through all of these kinds of tools, but we want to at least give you a sense of the lay of the land so that if you're curious to kind of veer off on your own to explore other things, you at least have a cheat sheet with which to begin. And I've put a thumbs up next to tools that we ourselves either use for some purpose or have used in the past. But when it comes to client side, Programming environments for people's students' own Macs and PCs. These are among the most popular options nowadays.、Um, and we, of course, per the thumbs up here, are using nowadays Visual Studio Code really for two reasons. One, because there's now this cloud based version thereof, it's sort of turnkey. We can get kids up and running quite quickly. But also, per yesterday, because it's downloadable too, at the end of our class, we encourage students to install it on their own. Suffer through any headaches of getting Python or something else to work, but once they already have had three or more months of programming under their belt. So, for us, narratively, I think that works well, but you might recognize some of your own familiar tools there. Client side, too, there's other more technical solutions, too. You can actually run this software, more on it in a bit, called Docker. So, you can run or have your students run their own containers. I wouldn't recommend this for an introductory course, but maybe a second or third level class, like particularly in systems where you want your students to have a specific. Specific version of Linux or more、uh, specialized tools available to them. But I think this is a very narrow use case for most faculty. So I wouldn't spend too much time contemplating that, most likely. And then you can do what we did in years past, which is give your students a full fledged virtual machine image that might be a gigabyte or more typically, and that would allow them to virtualize the entire operating system. But again, that's probably a solution for a lower level systems class for faculty interested in that. But we've done all this. And more. On the server side, meanwhile, like if you don't want students installing anything, you want something entirely server or cloud based, the list is longer and growing, I'm sure, over time. We've categorized these into paid only tools and free tier tools. So these are some popular tools out there nowadays.、Um, we ourselves at Harvard, thanks to a site license that the university has, use s a question and answer tool called Ed. I'm happy to introduce you to that or to the team there. They're pretty generous with like terms. Term long trials, but typically that is a paid upgrade eventually for asynchronous questions and answers. And Gradescope is a tool that came out of UC Berkeley a few years ago. It was acquired by a company called Turnitin, but that's a tool for, that makes it easier to grade not only paper based assessments, but also electronically submitted ones too. We use that with our undergraduates, but again, we use tools, the free tools we discussed yesterday, for our much longer, larger audience online simply because of licensing costs. But then there's a lot of free tiers too, either through education. Plans or just、uh, available to anyone. We, of course, are using Code Spaces. We have experimented with Colab, and that's a popular implementation of Jupyter Notebook, essentially, if you have Google Classroom at your school already. And then Replit's a very popular option, too, which gives you turnkey cloud based programming environments. As well, that we've experimented with over time. And dot, 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 there's many, many more. And feel free to discuss later today in one of our birds of a feather. So, just to give you a sense of what is happening underneath the hood. When you or students go to cs50.dev, there are a few configuration files that are making all of the magic happen. We have one file here called a Docker file in our own CS50 specific CLI, command line interface image. And then we layer on top of that image, so to speak,、uh, another Docker file. That's specifically for our code spaces. And what this file contains, as you'll soon see, is a bunch of commands that says install X, install Y, change this file, add this configuration. So it sort of automates at a low level all of the low,、um, underlying Linux commands that we want to run in advance for students so they don't have to futz with it themselves. So then when they go to cs50.dev, 
hit enter. Sometimes it might take a minute or more to start up for the first time. And what's happening is all of the commands in these files are essentially being run. It's a bit of a white lie. Technically, they've been run in advance. And so what's really happening is the results of those commands are being downloaded to their own individual code space. So we'll give you a glimpse of this. Again, this is not a prerequisite to teach any of CS50's courses. We're really trying to go one level deeper for you so you, know, one, understand what it is we're doing, but two, how you can do it yourselves if you so choose. There's one other file in the mix in this world of code spaces now in the cloud, which is a devcontainer.json file. And this is actually a pretty common, popular standard nowadays. Days, uh, largely among the Microsoft ecosystem and beyond, for configuring other details about a code space or a container. So it's in this file that you mention what Docker file or files you want to use. And it's in this file that you do things like pre install VS Code extensions, things like support for Python, support for C, support for CS50's Duck, and so forth. And if you're familiar with VS Code already, and maybe there are extensions you yourself like to use that you want your students to use. You could add those to a file that looks like this one here to just pre install all of that too. So you don't have to have in your homework a list of like 10 steps that your kids have to go through just to get up and running. It's all automatable as a, right, as a result. And this URL here, I just wanted to point out to draw your attention to how we get students off of code spaces, off of cs50.dev if they so choose at the end of the course. Our students are welcome to keep using our setup in the cloud, but on our own documentation page here, we have instructions for how students can either install VS Code on their Mac and PC and just connect to their code space in the cloud so they still don't have to install anything except VS Code. Or two, if they're feeling more comfortable, more advanced, they can alternatively install Docker themselves, run everything locally if they have no uh, internet connection whatsoever. Or perhaps they're in an area or a home that just doesn't have constant internet. There is a solution to that problem too, but for those more comfortable in general. And then there's this tool, which we ourselves don't use so much with students, but we do use ourselves quite a bit, CLI 50, Command Line Interface 50, which is a headless version of all of this graphical stuff. So if in your own Mac or PC, you want to have, with a quick command, CLI 50, enter, the exact same programming environments with all of the same tools on your own Mac or PC, just because it's faster for you as a more technical person uh, to do that than open a web browser, log in, and so forth. This is a headless version, so to speak, that has no graphical interface, but has all of the same commands in a black and white terminal window environment that might look a little something like this, if familiar. If not, if intimidating, this is not something you need to know either. It's just something that's available to you. Let me pause here and see if there's any questions on really just this high level lay of the land. Yeah, Peter. When we are in our code space, mm -hmm. right, uh, all of that is stored on GitHub. Can, do we have the, like, is that, <clears throat> I'm trying to think of the correct wording, mm -hmm. where we could, where, since it's all stored in the file system mm -hmm. within a Docker container mm -hmm. on code spaces, can we share those files publicly as well? as if we were sharing a software that we wrote? A good question. Can you share the files that are inside of a code space? Sort of. There's a couple of solutions to this problem. We pre-install a VS Code extension called Live Share, which allows you or anyone to click a button and share their code space with someone else so long as they too are logged in and it's up and running still. So this would be like Google Doc style collaboration. That does not lend itself to asynchronous collaboration. So if you ask your students to do it, they would essentially have to keep Live Share running while you're poking around. And if it goes to sleep, if they go to sleep, then you might lose that connection. Um, that though is the simplest uh, way to achieve things unless you have the students submit their files to you via something like Submit 50 or some other mechanism. Other questions on these high-level features? Oh, yeah, sorry. So I, I think you guys disabled, I think, intentionally IntelliSense for Correct. the completion of variable names, that sort of mm -hmm. stuff. If I were to make a different decision, is that easy to turn off that blocking and turn that on for my kids? Is that simple or is that like 
down in the weeds trying to uh, no. So to repeat for camera, if we have disabled certain settings that you disagree with and want to override, yes, there are ways to override that. In our documentation at cs50.readthedocs.io, there are explanations of how you can change settings. There's three types of settings in VS Code. And here's where it gets a little specific, but there's user settings, there are remote settings, and there are workspace settings. And in our documentation, you'll see which of those takes priority over the others. So the simplest way to have your students override certain settings would be to literally just tell them, go to this menu option, click this button. Or you could give them the key value pairs in JSON format. Or we're also thinking about ways where we could make it easier to you tell them to put it in a specific file and we'll make sure the settings are applied. But that does not exist yet. And the fourth and final option would be, don't use cs50.dev, use what Rong Shin is about to demonstrate. And then you can change any and all settings yourself. All right. Well, with that said, let me turn things over to Rong Shin for a deeper dive. And again, to emphasize, if you are feeling less comfortable, like that's OK. You do not need to do this. This is meant to just show you what's underneath the hood. So maybe in a year or more, uh, if you want to go to this level, you can. And Andrew, was there one question from the chat? Andrew Holmes, was that a question from the chat? Yeah, I think we had one question from the chat. Uh, the question was, what about sharing the other direction of the speakers pushing out to the students? What's the best way of doing that? Yeah, what's the best way for you as teachers to share content out with students? There you have a few options. If the code is available on the internet somewhere, like a zip file or the like, you can literally just have your students download that zip from your own LMS, Google Classroom, or anything like that, and then just drag and drop it into their code space. If it's at a public URL, you could instead have them run a uh, terminal window command like curl or wget that we ourselves use in our own homework assignments. Or as Carter will introduce us, you can use another tool called GitHub Classroom that makes it a little easier too to distribute files to students. All right, function. The clicker is yours. Thank you. Thank you, David. All right, so in, in the following section, I'm just going to walk you through how you can um, create your own code space. Um, before we started, so just to give you a high level idea, so each code space is based off a GitHub repository. So a GitHub repository has to exist first in order for you to create your own code space. So if there's no repository, there's no code space. That's why the first step is to create a private repository. I'm just going to do the live demo here on my laptop. So let's say I am a student um, of a particular course. And we, in, a, in a given uh, GitHub organization, and we have Codesway enabled. So the first thing is, if I'm going to create a brand new repository, I'm just going to click this uh, new button. It's a green button. So I'm just going to give it a name, right? So I can just say demo. And we can just leave everything as it is. And then I can just click Create Repository. So now there's empty in this repository, right? So as uh, David mentioned earlier, we need a Docker file. We need a dev container.json file. These two files basically shaped what your code space would look like. So first, I'm going to create a Docker file. I'm going to name it Docker file. And if you are looking at our uh, Google slide on your laptop, you will see a more detailed step. You can follow it there as well. Um, I'm just going to go back to my slide. So here is what a typical Docker file would look like. This is a very simple Docker file. Uh, it usually started with a base image. If you can uh, look at the first line, it says from Ubuntu latest, meaning the code space we are going to create, the underlying system would be Ubuntu, which is a Linux distro distribution. Um, we're going to create a code space based off the Ubuntu base image. And then we want to customize this Linux system, right? So the following comment basically means get the Ubuntu base image, run updates on it, and then install uh, Java runtime, Python runtime, and install another Python package called Pelo, which is the image library. So that's simple. So this image will give you a code space that has Python runtime and Java runtime. So I'm just going to go into copy paste all of this here. And I'm going to click Commit Changes. Now I have the Docker file. Now to create a code space, you also need a dev container.json file. 
So in that configuration file, we're going to reference this Docker file so that the code space, when the code space launch, it will um, build a Docker image based off this Docker file. So to do that, I'm just going to add a new file. And be, be careful, there's a, the file now is dot dev container dot JSON, so it starts with a period. JSON. And let me show you what a typical dev container JSON file looks like. So for this part, if we are going to use the Docker file as the base image, uh, this is very simple. The, the dev container JSON file literally just looks like this. It means when you launch a code space, please build an image based on the Docker file specified inside the repository. Since we named the Docker file, Docker file with the capital D, so it referenced that particular Docker file when launching a code space. So I'm just going to grab this key value pair. Just put it here. Click on Make Changes. Now you can see my repository we have two files. So if I go back to the very top level of my repository, you should see a green code button. That's because GitHub detected, OK, your repository has a dev container JSON file. You probably want to uh, run code space on top of the repository. So you just click the code button, click the code spaces tab, and then just click create code space on main. Since, since this um, code space is building the Docker image, at the, very, at, at, the, at, the, at the time it launched. So it would take some time to build this image because just because uh, uh, because what's happening underneath the hood right now, if I click view logs, what it does is it's trying to pull the Ubuntu image, run all those, com all those commands I specify in the Docker image. You can think of it as installing an operating system for your PC or any laptop. It is just this is uh, provisioning a virtual machine on the cloud on a Microsoft Azure. Uh, cloud infrastructure. So usually this would take about two minutes. So any question right now regarding Docker file? Because this is going to take two minutes anyway. So I can answer any question if you have. So these Docker files exist within the CS50? Yes. System, so you need to have a CS50 code space? Uh, not necessary. The, the, the thing I'm demoing here is nothing related to CS50 at all. Okay. It's standalone. But, but what this is essentially what we did behind the scenes. We also have a Docker file. We also have a very lengthy dev container.json file. But we pre-built the image. So the image already exists. So when students launch a CS50 um, code spaces, it doesn't need to build the image. It will just pull the image, and that's it. The, the system already exists. Question somewhere? I saw hands. OK. I have a question. Yes. Um, is this free to us as educators, or would this be free to anybody? I mean, obviously, some operating systems you pay for, but Linux, you wouldn't. But the, all of this, even if we weren't educators, would be would be free to do? I believe educator has free access to code space oh, okay. through GitHub. Through so GitHub. yes. Yeah. Okay. You have to request and verify you are a teacher, and then you should get a free code space, and your students should get a free code space. Although there's a quota limit per month, like six, some, some, some amount of hours, okay. like uptime hours. But yeah. But yeah, if, as you can imagine, you can make the Docker file very complicated and then further customize your code space. Yeah. yeah, the Docker file approach I demo here, you wouldn't want to do that because as you can imagine, it just takes longer time. But to give you a sense of how this all things work together, um, it's better for you to know you have this option. Tim, is, is Clang now standard with Ubuntu? Is it? Yeah. It is. it is built into the Ubuntu, yeah. Yes? Is this, uh, is this container is it only up when you're logged in over the code space? Because it's cool. So, so the question is, is the container only up when you are running the code space? So once the container is built, it is stored on AWS infrastructure. So when you close your code space and once you, so code, I mean from Microsoft and your code space is idle for like 30 minutes or something, it will just stop the container. It won't delete the container, it will stop the container. But if you don't use your container for like 30 days, 
right now that's the highest like retention period you can set your container will just get deleted. But the file there should be automatically pushed back to the repository. So the idea of a code space is <clears throat> you want to experiment something with your repository, but with a, like an operating system. You, you get a Linux op operating system on top of, of your repository. You work on something. Um, the, the container is meant to be discarded. But the way we use it just to turn it into like a full blown IDE, that's the. So, It will continue to run. For 30 minutes, or does it continue For 30 minutes, I think. Because yeah. once you close the browser, like, close, like GitHub Codespace detected the client disconnected, it will just like, stop it after 30 minutes or an hour. You can also set the idle time limit. I think it's four hour maximum. Like, so. All right, so our Codespace launch right now, as David also mentioned, you, you get a classic like Codespace uh, VS Code interface. But I just want to show you that um, the Python environment, Java runtime is all there. So if I run Python 3, you can see we have Python 3 already installed. If I run Java, well, Java version, right, you have Java runtime enabled as well. So to create a new file in, in, the, in the VS Code, there's a multiple way to do it. But one way is through the GUI interface, just to create a new file called hello.py. And I can just type um, hello world, right? So, and by the way, uh, sometimes, since this code space is very simple, right? Um, VS Code detected that, oh, you're working with Python, but you don't have any Python extension installed. Mm -hmm. So it would just, typically, it will recommend some useful extension for you, so you can install if you want. But, but later on, we can just pre-specify all these extensions so that you don't need students to install it when they're running their code space. So I'm just going to ignore it for now. And just to demonstrate, we can uh, run a Python program. Any questions so far? Yes? Can you run PyGen on this? Py, so you mean the graphical thing? Yes, we actually, so um, I will demo that in our CS50 code space. So in CS50, in CS50 code space, we added a GUI feature, like a virtual display feature to it. So yes, you could run that as well. But the virtual display will be open on a separate tab. That becomes your virtual display. Okay. All right, so to install extension, right, just to demo, we can just click this uh, extension icon here. There's a that tens of thousands extension you can install to further customize your code space. So for the for the demo, I'm just gonna install Python extension. What it does is it gives you Python like intelligence feature, so you can get access to all the you know methods and all that and code completion, but not necessarily copilot style, but typical code completion. So let's say, because remember um, in the Docker file, right? I also pre-install in Python package called Pillow. So if I do um, from Pillow, you already see the drop down IntelliSense like saying, okay, here are the methods you can use on this import image. Here are all the uh, available libraries or packages through this uh, Pillow um, package. That's just the that's just the extension that enabling this feature. So you can imagine you can customize more extension or even build your own extension and then install it in Codespace and then customize <coughs> for your student. Yep. Any questions? This one? Okay. Now, um, I'm going to, we can just ignore this code space for now. I'm going to just um, edit my dev container JSON file now. Because right now it's using the Docker file we wrote, but that slow, we don't want that. So we want to edit it to have it reference a pre-built image available on the internet. So this is the new dev container JSON file that we are going to use uh, to launch another new code space. So now it looks a little bit more complicated, but let me walk you through. This is the four major um, key in this dev container JSON file you want to pay attention to. Usually it's the image property, 
image basically means what Docker image do you want to use to launch this code space. There are many, many like pre-built Docker image available on the internet. Um, there's a Python image, meaning when you, when, if you run your code space based on this Python image, you will have a Python uh, friendly like runtime environment. So you can imagine you can switch to like Java, and then you have a Java runtime environment. And extension field basically means what extension do you want this code space to pre-install? Uh, it's an array of strings, so those are the um, extension identifier. You can find them on the marketplace. If you browse, it's as if you are shopping on the uh, VS Code extension marketplace. If you find some extension you think is interesting or think is useful for your student, just take a note down of those extension um, ID and then put it here. And once you launch your code, you will already have those extension installed. Features is just Right, feature, very self-explanatory. So you want to also like install some other like code space feature. So in this example, I'm just going to install the GitHub command line um, program. This is not this is optional. You, you don't need that. Extension is also optional. Settings. So uh, some teacher mentioned, could we also enable IntelliSense or disable IntelliSense? This is how we achieve via uh, via settings. Settings is to further customize the settings within uh, VS Code. Here is just a simple setting, like basically set the default theme to use solarized light. And you can imagine you can add hundreds of settings to customize your VS Code uh, further. <coughs> just gonna grab all this value here. So I'm just gonna update my dev container JSON file to the value I just uh, introduced. Commit changes. Now, since the dev container JSON file is now using an image from the remote uh, Docker repository, the Docker file is no longer being used. So, just to so in theory, your dev your repository can be as simple as just a one single dev container JSON file if you are not using the Docker file approach. I'm gonna launch a new code space again here. This time, it should take like shorter time to build and to launch the code space. Because the Python image is only like under 100 megabytes size in size, I think. Yeah. Any questions? Does any of the does any of the code space run in the local browser? Like does any of the processing, any of the work behind the, when a, kid, when a student runs a command in the terminal window? Oh, uh, when? On the local disk, or happen on the local processor, or is that all cloud? All cloud. Anything cloud. running, in this, so this terminal, as also David mentioned, that if you're running a VS Code offline on your desktop, your programming environment is your laptop. Okay. Now you're running this code space from GitHub, uh, right, remote uh, computer infrastructure. So your underlying infrastructure is their VM machine. So this terminal is the VM machine. It's the virtual machine on the cloud right now. So anything that you run in the terminal is executed remotely somewhere in the data center. Okay. But now, um, so as you can see, right, this code space only take, what, 20 seconds to launch, like compared to like two minutes from the Docker approach. You already see the theme change a little bit. It's not the default like, light theme. This is a solarized light theme. And since this is based on a Python image, we can check that it has the Python runtime, right? But if I do Java, I want to check if Java is installed. It shouldn't, because this image is meant to be for Python users. So it doesn't come with the Java runtime. And also, if you go on the extension, you will see the Python extension already being pre-installed, because we specify that in the extensions uh, field. Now. You Yes. When you do things with check 50 and submit 50, does it is it sensitive to the Docker that the student is using, or does it automatically assume CS50's environment? So, so check. So the question is, is check 50 submit 50 sensitive to the underlying programming environment? I would say yes and no. So, right now, right, right now in this um, programming environment there won't be any check 50 and submit 50 because we didn't install those. But you could install um, 
for the demo, right? I can install chat 50 using pick command because we also like publish chat 50 as a standalone Python uh, package on the website. So you could install chat 50 right now. So if you run chat 50, uh, the problem is um, we need to push your code to a student's private repository. So you will be prompted to enter like username and the personal access token, all the authentication. So if you don't use the CS50 code space, you, your student will need to go through that process or set out like SSH key um, configuration to do that. But it's insensitive in the sense that if you do that, you could still use check 50 and submit 50. Yeah. Now you might wonder, OK, if I want to further customize my dev container JSON, I want to iterate my container JSON file, it would be tedious to always go to the repository, edit that, launch your code space, right? So actually, CodeSpace allow you to rebuild your CodeSpace based on the latest dev container JSON file. So I'm just going to demonstrate that. So we want a Java runtime this time, right? So to do that, I'm, I'm just going to update my dev container JSON file to use the Java runtime. So what's changing is I, I just need to change the image I'm referencing to change the extension I want to install. Of course, you could install like the Python extension, but, but since you are working with Java, why, why, wouldn't you, why, why would you install that, right? Um, now I'm just going to change the setting uh, to use the dark theme, just to make it more visually like different. So here, if I in my dev container JSON file, this is the one in the repository, I can just replace it with the new value. And again, since the dev container JSON file defined the code space, so you can think of any changes to this dev container JSON file, code space will think, OK, you make some changes, so you perhaps want a new container with the latest setting. So code space will just prompt you, do you want to rebuild your code space? And yes, we want to rebuild our code space. When you guys do updates, is this how you do it? You push a new JSON file out, and that's when it says rebuild your code space to us? Yes. So we also have an extension that basically checking like each time student launch a kill space, we just check if the the details, if we check the hashes of our image matches the latest hashes that we pushed. If it doesn't match, meaning there's a new update. So we just prompt the student to do a review and then go through the whole review process and pull the new image, install the new, apply the new dev container JSON settings. And now, as you can see, the theme changed, right? Because it applied the latest settings to use Solarize dark settings. And right now, it shouldn't have the Python runtime anymore. You should have, it should have the Java runtime. And I can quickly show that. If I run Python 3, this command not found because this is not Python environment anymore. If I run, if I run Java, just to check the version, we have the Java runtime. So this is how you um, perform a code space review if you have new dev container JSON settings. Yeah, and that's it for the customization part on CodeSpace. Any question before we move on? How do I give this to students? Good question. So Carter will introduce how you would do it. So a, a great question. The question was, how do we actually give this to students? So we've seen so far some of the motivation behind code spaces. Like, why do we have these environments? Well, it's so students can program in the cloud and not on their own computer when they get bogged down in installing things over and over again. We instead have code spaces to help students have those things pre-installed, right? And Rongxin kindly showed us how we can customize that environment to install certain things and not others, which is optional for you all. You can get that deep if you'd like to, but you don't ultimately have to. And so today, I also want to show you how you can sh give code spaces to students using a tool called GitHub Classroom that you could use or you could not use. But the goal is to show you and help you make an informed decision of whether you want to use this or not. All right. So Code Spaces is a GitHub tool. GitHub is a software company. They make the tool behind Code Spaces. They also made GitHub Classroom to help teachers like us actually use it in their own classrooms. And there are really two pieces of prior knowledge you need to understand how Classroom works. So the first piece of prior knowledge is a GitHub organization. 
what is a GitHub organization? And the second piece is, what is a GitHub repository? So take maybe 30 seconds here. And if you think you know, what is a GitHub organization? Could I actually ask you to help share that out with the room? Anyone know what a GitHub organization is? Yeah, I could actually have you say it in the microphone if I could. <laughs> Thank you. Bunch of people sharing a repository. That's a good, a good definition of it. Any other ones, too, for those who are familiar with a GitHub organization? OK. So I think this idea of a collection of repositories is a good idea. But then what is a repository on GitHub? If an organization is a collection of repositories, what is a repository? Anyone have an idea that they want to share out for that? Definition? It's OK. If not, I can give you some idea here, too. So a repository is simply a place to put code. Oh, hand over there. OK, a place to put code. Good idea. So GitHub is an a software company. And they kind of host code a little bit like Google Drive hosts files. If I'm a programmer and I want to put my code somewhere, I could put it on GitHub in this container called a repository. Now, if I have many repositories, I might put those in a GitHub organization and put them all under one umbrella. And we'll see some examples of this a bit later on. But the reason these are important is because in GitHub Classroom, your classroom is a GitHub organization. And every assignment you make is a GitHub repository. So the entire thing is in the GitHub ecosystem. It just uses GitHub's underlying tools. They already have like organizations and repositories. So if you want to use a tool like GitHub Classroom, you only need to take a few steps here. Among them are these. So first, create your own GitHub organization, which is your classroom. We'll walk you through this in a minute. You will then add some distribution code. There's the code you want students to start with to a repository in that organization. You will then make that repository what we call a template, letting students take it and modify it and submit their work in that repository itself. And then you can use GitHub Classroom to kind of formalize that within the Classroom interface to make it more cleanly done for you here. And as a student, all a student will have to do is simply accept the assignment and work on the assignment with code spaces and actually show you what this looks like in the classroom environment in just a bit. But any clarifying questions on this so far, on repositories and organizations? Yeah? For an organization, if we have multiple classes, can there, mm -hmm. be, can there be groups within the organization, or would we create different organizations for each separate class? Yeah, a great question. So the question was, if I have um, maybe different Wait, can you say it again so I can make sure I got it? Yeah, just if you have different classes, would that be different organizations, or can you create groups within an organization? Yes. Yeah, so let's say you teach more than one class, right? Do I need to make then multiple organizations, or can I put it all under one organization? The answer to that is you have to make multiple organizations. So if you have more than one class, you should make more than one GitHub organization, ultimately. Other clarifying questions before we move on, on either organizations or repositories? OK, so let's actually see what these look like actually on github.com. So what we'll do here is actually create your very own free GitHub organization. And you can do this if you want to follow along. You can go to this URL right here, which is also in the slides for reference, github.com slash organizations slash plan. And if you go to that URL, I'll put it back up in a minute, you should see something like this. Pick a plan for your organization. Well, because we're teachers, you should probably just choose the free option. This gives you everything you need. You don't need to pay for your organization. You can click that free option there to make your very own GitHub organization. Again, by going to this URL right here, github.com slash organizations slash plan. And to our point earlier, this creates for you a space, a name on github.com to put your many repositories, places you want to store your code files that are ultimately going to be your assignments for your classroom. So feel free to keep working here. I'll keep moving, and we'll keep going here. But let me um, feel free to raise your hand if you get stuck or want some help here. Now the next step is to create 
a repository in that organization. So remember, an organization is a collection of repositories, and repositories hold code. So our goal here is to first add a repository to our organization, which is kind of the same thing as adding an assignment to our classroom for students to complete. So you could create a new repository at this URL right here, github.com slash new. And you should see a page, a bit like this, that asks you some details about how you want to make this repository, this place to store code that a student will eventually work on. Now the main thing to tweak here is this owner section. At first, it should be blank, but you can change it to be the name of your organization that is, of course, your classroom. So here I called mine cs50-educator-workshop-23. That is my organization name, also my classroom name, and therefore I'm going to make this repository inside this organization. All right. Now this will eventually hold the code I want to give to students as part of this assignment. And I'll do that using GitHub Classroom in a minute. But clarifying questions here before we keep going. All right, so all we've done is made our own organization. We're going to add a repository that will hold some code we want to give to students. So now we're going to actually add some code to this repository. And we can do that using github.com's interface. I could go to the code editor, which um, is kind of linked in the slide notes if you'd like, or you can kind of find it by going to your repository and clicking edit. We can go into more depth later if you'd like, but the goal is to save some time for AI. So we'll also add some code to our repository here, and we'll then say this becomes the code a student would receive when they accept the assignment, when they actually work on this assignment. Let's say I'm going to give students now an empty main function in Python, and I want them to write hello world, for instance. But for now, I'm just leaving it blank for the student to work on. So here we can see I have my distribution code now in this repository. My repository was called hello. My assignment is called hello. I'm now going to put in hello.py, which is blank, a hello.java file, which is blank, and what Rong Shin talked about, which is the code space customization, if I want to include that. So now as a whole, we have this assignment, the code to give to students. This assignment is inside our organization, this place that keeps track of all of our repositories and thus all of our assignments. So now, to work with GitHub Classroom, I need to turn this repository into a template, letting students actually take it and put it in their own GitHub uh, account and change it as they'd like to. So very simple here, I can go to settings in my repository, click this checkbox, it's a template repository, and now students could take it, they could modify it, and they could submit something as we'll see a little bit later on. Just one more necessary step here. And then I can go ahead and sign into GitHub Classroom. I've set everything up that I need to on github.com. I can now use GitHub Classroom. So to sign in, I can go to classroom.github.com. You will see something a bit like this. You could sign in with your GitHub username and get started with actually turning your organization into a classroom and your repositories into assignments. That makes sense. So it'll first ask you to connect. You'll see something like this. You can click Accept if you'd like. And you'll then see the UI to create your own classroom from that organization you created earlier. So you could so click here, say New Classroom. And once you're there, you could choose the organization you created. So here I had originally created csu-educator-workshop-23. I can choose this now and decide to make that into a GitHub Classroom of my own. Once I do that, I can give it an official name. Here I'll call it the same thing, or slightly different, Educator Workshop Classroom, and I can create it. So I'll now be able to add people as teachers who also have GitHub usernames. I'll skip that for now. I could also add students manually if I wanted to, but I'll also skip that. For now. So now I have my very own GitHub Classroom that I created from my organization. And then I can add an assignment. I can say, let me go ahead and create an assignment in this classroom. Well, as we said before, what is an assignment? It is a repository in our organization. So I'll say, create an assignment down here. 
And I'll then be able to choose um, some settings here. I'll give it a title, give it a deadline if I'd like, set the visibility, which you often keep to private, and we don't tend to grant students admin access to their repository. We can then, most importantly, set the template repository. So here, the repository I created earlier was called Hello inside my own organization. I want this repository to be the base of my assignment, the code that I actually give to students as part of this assignment. So this is where I configure that now here. I could also, if I wanted to, choose to use code spaces as the editor of this assignment right here. And once I do that, I can also um, choose ways to give feedback to students. But for now, let me pause and ask for questions on any of this, any clarifying questions so far. Okay. Yeah, question from the chat, Andrew. Yeah, I have one. So the question is, can you reuse, reuse the organization uh, next year for a new classroom? Like the organization is the template of the classroom for the group of students? Good question. So can you reuse your classroom kind of year over year over time? Uh, you can. I think our suggestion is tending to recreate it for every new class you have. Because as you'll see, you'll have students who submit work in your current class. Their work will still show up if it's in a future year. So best to kind of recreate your organization and your classroom year over year, semester over semester, whatever you'd like. Good. OK. So here you can see we have now created the assignment. If you were following along, oh, this is going very fast, you could see something a bit like this. And now the main part is, the kind of magic that happens, is you can use this invitation link to give to students, and they'll be able to see your assignment, see it in code spaces, and be able to work on it in code spaces as well. So the reason we did those steps was to get this link right down here. We can give to students, and they'll then be able to see your code that you added to your repository as part of an assignment and work on that assignment in code spaces. So now, as a student, let's say you have this invitation link your teacher gave you. You could simply copy and paste it into your URL bar, and you'd then see something like this, accept the assignment that we had called hello. Right? We could then say, OK, as a student, I want to accept this assignment. I want to work on it in code spaces in GitHub Classroom. Now, it'll take a minute to configure. I can then refresh the page, and I'll see I'm ready to go. Now I have my very own GitHub repository that I will be working on, my own personal one as a student. Uh, in more technical terms, I've cloned this repository. I've taken the code inside of it and put it into my own repository to work on as a student, again, on my own. So now if I go to this link, I can then see I have the very same code that me as a teacher originally put in that repository. But now as a student, I could click up top. I could say, code, let me actually work on this in code spaces. So let me say, code, create code space on main. I'll go through that same step Rong Shin showed us earlier, building up my code space. And finally, I'll see that code in code spaces itself. As a student now, I can work on it, modify it, say, I want to print hello world, and then push those changes. I'll then see them in my repository. And as a teacher, I'll be able to actually see, at first, Carter submitted nothing. But as soon as he pushed that template repository, I now see that he submitted some work. So again, this is kind of one way of using code spaces to manage your classroom, to see student progress. But it's not the only way. It's only one tool in your toolkit. So let me pause here and ask again questions on this, this process, how it works, or how anything that we've done with it ourselves. Yeah? I, tr uh, I tried GitHub Classroom this year, but uh, testing submitted work uh, takes a lot of time, actually. Yeah. Are you familiar with this problem? Yeah, and can I ask you, so the question for the, the microphone here was, um, it takes a lot of time to test submitted work. Like, let's say, for example, I want to see, did Carter submit the assignment correctly? Right? Was the code correct or was it not? And it can be kind of tough to configure that. Can I ask you what you tried first before I share what we've done? Uh, no, I, I just made uh, the, the project and uh, sent the link. And uh, if there is uh, more, more than 10, 10 tests, 
Uh, it takes uh, it takes minutes or two or even three. Yeah. Test that and I think that's kind of uh, the thing at the microphone here. So the reality is, if you have maybe like ten or more tests, it can take a long time for those tests to run to ensure that student code is correct. And I think sometimes the reality here is like we're on some virtual machine that is in the cloud somewhere, and that's just how long. It takes. We've done some own custom configuration with Check50 that if you want to use, I have Rung Shin probably talk more about that. Um, but I don't know if we have much of a solution to that problem, unfortunately. A good question, though. Yeah. Yeah, Bruce. Um, there's a tool that GitHub offers, GitHub Classroom uh, client, where you can download all the repositories mm -hmm. down to your instructor machine to, to go over and review them as well. Interesting. Yeah, so um, again, for the microphone, there is currently a supported version of like a GitHub Classroom desktop application that will let you take all of your student submissions to an assignment and download them. So you can see them on your own local machine, perhaps run tests there if you'd like to. Um, I believe, based on what I've heard from GitHub, that that is being deprecated soon. But they are making a new um, command line interface that will do the same thing. So they are improving it over time. Okay, so I believe this is about it for GitHub Classroom. Please feel free to let me know if you have any more questions, but I'll turn it back over to Rong and to David to talk about our new tools that go along with many of these we've discussed before. Thank you, Carter. So goal here is a high-level overview and then a low-level overview. And so here is what the team has wonderfully been working on thus far. Um, for the past two plus years, we've had a rubber duck debugger in virtual form. You might recall your own rubber ducks that you got the other day that you might even already have had back home. And the goal of those rubber ducks, if unfamiliar, is to have this inanimate object on a student's desk with whom or to whom they can talk. The idea being that as they explain some bug they're having, some confusion they're having, that prevents a light bulb goes off because they hear in their own words exactly what kind of confusion they're experiencing. And so we implemented this some time ago in the form of a chat window that looks a little something like this in VS Code where students can message this duck debugger. It's a pun on the GNU debugger, GDB. We have DDB. Um, however, for multiple years, all the duck would do when a student asked a question like this, I'm hoping you can help me solve a problem, the duck would only quack once, twice, or three times. So it, it too was fairly inanimate. However, as of 2023, I'm happy to say that Rungshin and team have been bringing this duck to life. Um, in the context of GPT, uh, in the context of large language models, and in the context specifically of the chat GPT, um, this is now possible, it would so seem. This, of course, over the past six plus months has created quite a few concerns among academics uh, in terms of academic honesty. What do tools like chat GPT, GitHub Copilot, the new Bing, the experimental version of Google actually mean for academic honesty, or conversely, plagiarism? And I would offer, as we discussed, uh, or as I proposed yesterday, um, that we actually view this as quite um, potentially possible positive for education. There's absolutely those downsides of students being able to just ask a bot to do their homework for them. But again, I dare say that that's always been possible where a student could just ask a friend to do that, even though it's a little easier now to do it anonymously with a computer and not an actual human. But with that said, just wanted to give you a sense of how we're thinking about the implication for these tools for the fall and how we are trying to respond to them also through software solutions. So as of now, we suspect that this will be in our syllabus this fall. And indeed, it is in CS50 syllabus this summer with the 70 or so students who are taking CS50 over these next few weeks. Using AI-based software, such as ChatGPT, GitHub Copilot, the new Bing, and others, that suggests or completes answers to questions or lines of code is considered not reasonable. So essentially, by policy, we will aspire to prohibit use of these tools. Practically speaking, that doesn't stop anyone from using them, of course, but we've had a long history in the class of certainly having this ingrained in our policy, and we do aspire to detect plagiarism, and therefore we write up students administratively for disciplinary processes if they seem to have crossed those lines. Um, but this is where we're landing right now, quite simply because these tools are just too helpful right now. Like ChatGPT is more than happy to try to give you the answer to all of your questions. And that's not ideal in an educational context. It would be like an overzealous tutor just telling the students how to do their homework. So this is language we suspect we will have in our syllabus this fall, and we do currently have this summer using CS50's own AI-based software that suggests or completes answers to questions or line of code. 
will be considered reasonable. And so I dare say we're in this fortunate position of being computer scientists that we can kind of build layers on top of these tools. And that's not a cap、uh, capability available to teachers, for instance, in other fields. So you and I are sort of in this unique ecosystem to try to be at the forefront of finding a happy medium here. Of course, you all are welcome, whether you're teaching CS50 specifically or even your own classes, to use the tools that you're about to see. They're definitely attenuated for CS50 specifically, but in general, what we're trying to do is. Put downward pressure on just how helpful ChatGPT is. So, in the context of LLMs, for instance, and using these kinds of interactive bots, it's very common to provide what are called prompts. And you and I, if you've used ChatGPT, have already typed prompts. It's essentially the ChatGPT version of your Google search query, but generally writing it in English or some longer form sentence. What you can do with a lot of these models, though, at least if you're writing software that interacts with them, is you can feed it a few English sentences in advance, like pretend you are a teacher. Teacher of introductory computer science, do not provide more than two or three lines of code in your answer. So, students don't have to type that. You don't have to ask them to type that. We're sort of feeding sentences like that into the model before we then append students' own questions. And so, Um, what this means for us concretely is that we're trying to employ AI along a few different lines here. And I'll give you a quick pedagogical overview and turn things over to Rong Shin for an actual discussion thereof. But one, and this exists for already, explain highlighted lines of code.、Um, students can now, in CS50.dev, highlight one or more lines of code, right click it. Choose an option that's called explain highlighted code. And then using ChatGPT generated English, we aspire to explain what that line or those lines of code do so that if students will receive some distribution code from you, if they found something online in a reasonable way and just want to understand it better, they can ask questions of the bot in this way. Two, advising students on how and why to improve their code style.、Uh, if you've used CS50's tools like Style50 before, we had a terminal version window of this that tried to show them visually where they should or should not put. White space and other characters. We now have, thanks to the team, a graphical version of that that not only shows the student left and right, here's what your code looks like, here's what it should look like. There's now a button that says、uh, explain why that similarly tries to help them see what you and I might take for granted once we're more comfortable with code that they might not be noticing is awry.、Um, we use that tool for QA called Ed. Um, that happens to be used in Harvard courses as well. And we've integrated the same technology there to try to answer students' questions automatically. Four, a work in progress, explaining arcane, that is,、uh, cryptic error messages, and providing hints on how to solve. So if you've ever seen the output of Clang, if you've ever seen the output of even Python and tracebacks, it's fairly non obvious, certainly to a new student, what some of those words even mean. So explaining those, translating them really into layperson's terms is the goal. Helping students eventually find bugs in their code via TF or teaching assistant like rhetorical questions. So, not just saying it looks like you're doing X on line 13, do this instead. To instead draw their attention to it. It looks like you're doing something incorrect on line 13. Have you considered dot, 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 like any good teacher might? And then, longer term, we're hoping to integrate assessment into these tools. So, actually grading. Uh, with software, not just correctness with Check 50, style with Style 50, but design with, shall we say, Design 50, a tool that provides human like qualitative feedback on the quality of code. So just because their code looks aesthetically good, just because their code works according to the specification, maybe they have、uh, a nested, 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 nested for loop, and that's probably not the right design. There's better ways, more efficient ways to solve the same problem. We hope to point those out to students.、And And then, longer term, still, my own hope is that we can perhaps leverage AI to actually assess students at the end of the course, throughout the course, in a virtual version of yesteryear's oral exams, where we actually have a bot eventually. Not now, having a sort of conversation with students, initially textually, maybe eventually verbally, so that we can do the equivalent of that one to one teacher student ratio that has, has and will always escape us as long as there's only one of me, one of you, and 20 students, 30 students, 300 students instead. So allow me to turn things over to Rong Shin here、um, with one final thought on grades philosophically. Right now, we ourselves, for our fall class for undergrads, we're actually wrestling with what, does the, what do these tools mean for grades? Not just how we assess, but the numbers that we have assist,、uh, um, traditionally come up with for their grades, whether they're an A, a B, a C, or whatnot. Because what we have seen empirically with CS50. 
is that once we released Check 50, once we released Style 50, grades numerically started going up and up and up. And this was actually a good thing, I think, because students were getting iterative feedback. They were getting feedback before they submitted their code that it's not yet right. It's not yet right. So of course, if they're putting in the time, by the time they submit, it should be right because they have these tools. And so our conjecture, if not worry, but I do think, again, this is a good thing, if we eventually provide them with a Design 50-like tool where they're getting qualitative feedback, like, oh, you can do better. Or, Yes, it works, but you should improve this still, much like iterating on an English essay. By the time they submit that work, you know, it kind of should be perfect, at least for those students who are engaging to that extent. And so I think this is going to call into question exactly what it is we're assessing and how we're assessing, but hence our idea about more conversational assessment down the line. Is this a question here? No? No? All right. Well, allow us to turn things over to Rung Shin and the real world demos. All right. Thank you, David. All right, so uh, to give you all a uh, preview of the tool we've been building, so I'm just going to give you the actual demo of what this tool is actually doing right now. If you all go to CS3.ai right now, you can actually try the tool we've been building. I'm just going to try here on my end as well. So I'm just going to CS3.ai. Um, as David previous previously mentioned, we used to have a RubberDuck debugger built with, within the VS Code, but it, only quack, quack, it can only uh, say quack, quack, quack to you. But here, we bring the duck to the browser, and learner, uh, have, whoever has a GitHub account, can actually chat with this duck right now. And just to quickly demo you, what you can do with this duck, you can ask basically all CS50 questions and computer science related questions. And it is built on top of ChatGPT, but we have our own system message. We have our own user prompt to wrap each uh, user message into our own prompt to prevent prompt injection attack and all that to basically um, customize a experience as if you are talking to a tutor for CS50, something like that. So I can ask, what is Flask, right? It's a Python framework, and I see how the duck responds. So this shows you um, you can ask informational question to the duck, and the, the duck will just give you some definition of a certain framework. But some of you might ask, what if a student trying to uh, get solution out of the duck, like want the duck to complete a homework for you? So if I ask, can you implement the finance piece for me? I'm really stressed out right now. Please, please. <laughs> just like begging, right? So. All right, let's see how the duck said. Yeah, the duck is sorry. Um, but yeah, the duck actually are hearing academic honesty right now because every answer the duck generated uh, it are hearing academic honesty. So it won't provide solution, but it will try to uh, guide the student to implement the finance piece instead. Like basically, instead of showing the code to student, it will be more beneficial for the student. What if the duck just like guide you step by step? So I would just say, all right. Uh, show me uh, a high level uh, of how I can approach this. So yeah, now the duck is like responding by showing some like high level like steps how you can implement a finance pieces. Um, by the way, any audience here want to ask a arcane question to the duck? So yeah, um, this is basically what the CS5.ai does right now. Um, it actually also offer like some API endpoint that power all our other like explain highlighted code, uh, explain style 50 changes to student uh, through this uh, CS50.ai services. So now I'm going to like show you what if the student are actually within the VS Code and if they want to use this um, duck debugger.
So yeah, again, the duck debugger is also now available uh, within our CS50 code space. Uh, it is on the left-hand side. If you click on the duck icon, the duck is available there. I can ask the same question, right? So what is Flask? It will also give you an answer right there. But now the cool thing about this duck uh, built into the VS Code is that student could also um, easily interact with the duck while working on their uh, homework assignment. For example, if I want, um, if I'm working on the finance piece, set, I don't quite understand what this line means. Um, what I can do is I can use the plugin we wrote called Explain Highlighted Code. Just let the duck explain. Okay, what does this code do for me? So it will just explain in plain English like what this code is doing, um, so that you can get your question answered right within VS Code. You don't need to like post on a like a forum or something and get answered after a few hours later. And sometimes maybe you are working 2 a.m. morning, there's no TA available to you, but you can still get answer uh, right within your IDE. There's another tool called Style50. Uh, basically, uh, as I also mentioned yesterday, uh, it offers style feedback. For example, yeah, if I have a code looks like this, uh, it works, but it looks pretty bad. So I can just run Style50. So Style50 will give you visual feedback on, on how you can improve your style of the code. But sometimes it might be confusing, like what does that actually mean? So you can just click Explain Changes and have the duck explain what changes had made to you. So you, if you click that, does it work? <gasps> Live demo. All right, let me try again. Yeah, so it, so the duck will basically explain what's happening to you. So as if it's a human TA sitting next to you, like telling, oh, this is what you should make your changes. This is what the change means. So that kind of thing. So we still in the progress of iterating how we can further incorporating the explain highlighted code uh, via the duck so that everything is like integrated within the duck debugger. And Rongxin, I yep. see that there's an apply changes button. Do we have oh, any yeah. statistics on the frequency with which the students manually fix the code on the left versus just click a button? Oh, yeah. So what apply changes means, so Style50 give you the feedback. Um, you can manually like work on to improve your code uh, to, to match the suggested feedback, right? But if I'm lazy, I can just click apply changes, and my code is well formatted. Uh, statistically, we have uh, been seeing that about 75% of students just click apply changes, but there's still 25% of students out there like manually fixing their code, which is still encouraging. So given that um, there's an easier way to do it, but yeah. Anything else? Any questions so far with the two? Any question about how, how these things works? Yes. As teachers, do we get any access to what the students, what questions the students have asked? Debugger? That's a good question. Uh, right now, no. Right. Uh, I would say this is more of a privacy issues. Okay. Um, but yeah, no. Okay. Actually, I think that's the demo so far. Let me. So yeah, we have go through all these AI plugins. So yeah, um, that concludes the AI demo. So we eventually bring the ducks to life. Uh, we, <laughs> hope, we, we hope to uh, keep iterating and keep you know, improving our tool. Uh, right. And it's an exciting time right now, uh, for sure. So yeah. It is. And I would offer a thank you to Rong Shin and our team for spending so much time on this this summer. And I would offer to really the silver lining of all this or the opportunity is that especially if you've been teaching smaller classes or large classes, but uh, just by yourself, like the uh, corollary of having a one to one teacher student ratio is that you're about to have like as many TAs in some sense as you need. And it's not going to be perfect initially, but I think even from the interactions you hopefully saw from Rong Shin, I do think it's pretty darn encouraging how we can help students now, even when you're the only human teacher in the room.